I come at the behest of the Lord our King. His name is Adonai. Some call him Jehovah. Others call him Yahweh or simply Yah. There, there are various English transliterations of his powerful name. Briefly mentioning bad religion, I should explain that there are several sacred name cults that exist out there that dictate their followers use their own special pronunciation for their strange transliterations of the original biblical Hebrew names of They're quite convinced of their views, but they are mistaken. By the way, less religious, more secular folks often refer to God as the big guy in the sky, the man upstairs, or their higher power. Some sincere people just refer to him generically as God. I guess in some settings that's okay, but oftentimes it is a confusing, incorrect description. We would do well to remember that too many silly people believe in a nondescript lowercase g God. If asked, they believe in God. You see, in fact, they don't believe in the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, or the Creator God of the heavens and the earth. They believe in a God they have created in their own vain imagination to fit their belief of how a good God should look to them. Unfortunately, that leaves them with a genuinely false God. So allow me to be clear and precise. I believe in the God of Moses. He is my God. Is He your God too? To a world in chaos, He comes as Jehovah Shalom. He is the God of peace. For those confused sacred name cult members out there, be aware that God Himself declared His own sacred name. He did so to Moses and to us. It was a remarkable moment in the history of the children of Israel when God revealed another aspect of Himself to His people, to us. He doubled down on it and repeated His name twice, simultaneously, for everyone in His audience to hear. In fact, His name is written identically five times in a single brief two-verse section. Of course, as some folks must surely understand, Biblical Hebrew was written without vowels. Likewise, the cantillation marks and the vowel points we see in today's Hebrew Bibles were later scribal editions. It is also worth mentioning that there are well-known Jewish traditions and rabbinic practices of not speaking or writing the holy name of God outside of very specific circumstances. When Jewish people write the Word of God, they use a dash instead of the letter O to avoid risking having the written name of God desecrated. And it is common to not even speak the Hebrew name of God outside of legitimate prayers or when reading or chanting the Scriptures. I also acknowledge that as Jews, we have certain acceptable replacement names for God, such as Hashem, the name, or Adoshem in certain circumstances. These alternative names are used to avoid speaking His holy name inappropriately. In my own books, when I include Hebrew sections proposed for liturgical use, I use a Hebrew abbreviation for God's name, to follow that protocol. This is not much ado about nothing. It is all done to respect the holy name of the Lord. Unfortunately, nobody has the original audio recordings or the YouTube video of that fateful day when God declared His own name Himself to Moses. And all that we can know with confidence is that the four Hebrew letters, Yud, He, Vav, hey, represent the name God wanted us to hold dear. Jehovah is not a terrible transliteration of those letters. In our Hebrew prayers, we prefer Adonai. Of course, the 
Various sacred name cults out there in the world, their leaders have convinced their naive adherents that they have unique special knowledge that neither Jews nor Christians have. I won't argue the point because until the Lord repeats his name himself on the other side of all this earthly chaos, we won't really know definitively. So I'm willing to be patient and go with the flow on this one. But you should hear the words for yourself as believed by those of us who do read the Hebrew Bible. This is a Hebrew Bible. It's called the Tanakh. It's an abbreviation for the customary tripartite division of the Jewish scriptures into three sections. The first and most famous portion is the Torah, which is comprised of the five books of Moses. The second section is the Nevi'im, which includes the prophets. And the third section is the Ketuvim, which includes those works such as Psalms and Proverbs. These are classified among the Hebrew wisdom writings. The Hebrew Bible includes all of the same books that are in the Christian Old Testament, but the order of placement is slightly different. Now, God declared his name in the 34th chapter of Exodus. This, by the way, is a chumash. It's the Hebrew five books of Moses, chumash. It's also known as the Torah. And I'm going to read you what God declared to Moses in Hebrew. Vayered Adonai be'anan v'yisyatsev imo sham v'yikra b'shem Adonai v'yaavor Adonai al panav v'yikra Adonai Adonai el rachum v'chanum erech apayim v'rav chesed v'emet. My friends, we can be confident that God wanted us to know that he has a name to be revered. And he also wanted us to know his character. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is long suffering. He is full of goodness, mercy, and truth. He's willing to forgive us, but he is not willing to overlook our evil behavior. That is part of the reason the world faces wars. You can be certain of this. Regardless of how you choose to identify God or how you feel it most appropriate to pronounce his name, please remember three things about God, his sovereign declaration of his own name in Exodus chapter 34. Number one, the Lord himself declared his name. Number two, then he declared his character. And number three, then he declared his judgment. I want to read the words in English to you. I just think that you need to hear them. You need to understand them. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. God declared his own name to Moses, to the children of Israel, and to us. And then he declared his character. And finally, he declared his judgment. The world is in chaos because God's judgment is on a near horizon. The fact of a coming judgment is inescapable. People can pretend things are normal, but anyone who's paying attention must know that we hear the distant thunder of war. God's judgment looms across a world ill-prepared for the violent shaking that awaits. Nowhere will be spared from the hard rain that is soon to fall. In fact, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. 
Do you have an anchor for your soul? Moses declared that the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. However you choose to identify our holy, sovereign, creator, God of the universe, you can be certain that His pronouncements were true. And like it or not, the Lord is a man of war. He said that about himself. He was not foretelling the name of a famous Kentucky Derby winning racehorse of the same name. Man of war. <laughs> Moses was describing one mighty characteristic of the unchanging God of Israel. Yet in spite of that aspect of God's character today, I bring you peace. I bring you hope. Even when this world comes to an end, those who know the Lord are promised a better world to come and life eternal. But this promise is conditional. Are you prepared? In the meantime, are you ready for war? Some in my audience may be personally acquainted with war. Some may have loved ones in harm's way right now. American servicemen and women are deployed around the globe doing good and honorable work. I pray for our troops at home and abroad. In fact, I keep a little green soldier on my counter that I see every day so I will be reminded of their service and my obligation to uphold them in prayer. Some families who hear this may have lost loved ones. Others are still dazed by the emptiness they feel because of pain caused by senseless violence that impacted them or their loved one. Everyone is tired of the violence in the Middle East. We all want to see an end to the struggles between Jews and Arabs, radical Muslims and persecuted Christians, Russians and those who stand in the way of the former Russian Empire. Thinking people of the world know that Taiwan remains a thorny obstacle to China's reunification ambitions. They are also our allies. And there are military conflicts popping up like whack-a-moles globally. The weak and powerless are usually those who suffer the most. Will we have the resolve to defend the defenseless? The ongoing struggles in Israel are a perfect example. Do we have the fortitude to stand by our friends? Will we continue to support the underdogs? And don't you be deceived. The underdogs in the region are not the so-called Palestinians. How can so many naive sheep be fooled into believing that Israel is the aggressor? What spell has been cast over the world that caused them to be blinded to the fact that Arabs control over 99% of the land in the Middle East? Israel is surrounded by Arab enemies. The Jewish nation has a small fraction of less than 1% of the land. Yet the Arab world and those anti-Semitic hate mongers among the progressive wing of the Democrats in the United States Congress continue to demand that Israel give up large pieces of its tiny plot of ground. And they blame the region's problems on Israel's unwillingness to share their small piece of their little sandbox. It is sheer madness. It begs an obvious question that few are willing to ask. How come no Arab nation will allow their Muslim brothers and sisters to share any of their overwhelming 99% of the land controlled by the Arab world? I mean, it should be clear to anyone but an anti-Semite that the Palestinians are only valuable to the Arab cause as long as they can serve as pawns in the Arab propaganda wars. Israel is not the evil aggressor in the region. I never thought I'd see the day when millions in America would turn against our best ally in the Middle East. It would have seemed impossible that so many nations could have given way to governments committed to, the, to rid the world of Jews. Remember, Bad religion and bad wars can spring from bad politics. And while I'm discussing this topic, the next time you see angry, violent, anti-Israel protesters declaring from the river to the sea, 
Palestine must be free. Interpret that correctly. It is the clearest declaration of rabid anti-Semites calling for the eradication of the Jews. They are the modern day Nazis. They want the destruction of Israel. As long as even a fraction of 1% of the land remains under Jewish control, those who hate the Jews will blame the Jews and ignore the facts of history, geography, and the sovereign revealed will of God. Don't believe the revisionist history spouted by anti-Semitic mouthpieces. The same deceivers who wish to rewrite history also spin the narrative that Palestinian terrorists are freedom fighters and martyrs. They are not. It's a coward who blows up Israeli public transit buses or crowded pizza parlors. These are not heroes. Palestinian murderers who slaughter nursing Israeli mothers and infant children are not freedom fighters. They're Palestinian monsters who do unspeakable things to Jewish girls. They kidnap and kill Jewish mothers and humiliate Jewish grandmothers. These are not warriors. They're terrorists. Nonetheless, the supporters of Hamas and the Free Palestine protest leaders are unwitting shills for America's enemies who promote the destruction of Israel. That is why they are also unashamed to chant death to America. Will Americans ever wake up to the fact that such behavior emboldens the enemies of freedom? Those who wire explosives to their own bodies or to the bodies of their wives and children reveal the wickedness of their hearts. And what does that say about their religious leaders who fuel such hatred? Bad religion leads to bad Wars. Arab suicide bombers don't dream up their devastating plans alone. They're radicalized and trained by bad religious leaders who deceived them into thinking that the murder of civilians was a holy thing. Bad religion is what convinces terrorists to kill unbelievers. And the power of such bad religion convinces the terrorists to believe that they are assured of salvation by their killing spree. With all this bad news, I want you to know that there is still good news. True hope can exist, even for a terrorist. They can still trade in their hate for love. Yes. There are bad religions. Yes, there are bad wars. But I promise you that I know a good God. Even the most hopeless man or woman on earth can be offered hope in Christ. Therefore, I thank God for those Christians who share God's love among those who most need to hear the gospel. I thank God that He is sovereignly reaching across the Middle East, granting visions and dreams, calling people to Himself in the night. God doesn't want us to ignore the lost so that they would perish in hopelessness and hatred. The untold tragedy of this horror story is that many young Muslim men genuinely want to please God but they have no assurance of their salvation. Sadly, bad religion trains them to believe that the only way to be certain that they have fulfilled their required obligation to God is to die in His service. In other words, if they die in jihad while killing infidels, their reward in paradise is guaranteed and therein is a crucial difference between a radicalized, violent, Islamic fundamentalist and a peaceful, rational Muslim who just wants to enjoy their faith without destroying others of different faiths. You know, many Muslims enjoy both American and Israeli freedoms. Such freedom 
is not available in many Arab nations. Bad wars and bad politics will never improve the situation. The call of the gospel remains the best way for this hatred to stop and for the cycle of death to be ended. Protests did lead the way to end the war in Vietnam, but protests will not change the Middle East. Israel can never close its eyes to the horrors of what happens when terrorists are in control. No amount of protests will convince Israel to make allowances for monsters like the Palestinian religious fanatics who slaughter innocent civilians to intentionally multiply the body count of the innocent. The goal of such terrorists is to create and amplify terror. That is why Palestinian terrorists bring death and destruction to their own people. That is why Palestinian murderers launch missiles from residential apartment complexes or fire mortars from schools or mosques. That is what compels Palestinian terrorists to hoard guns and explosives beneath hospitals where terror tunnels provide means for deadly assaults against Jewish civilians. That is why increasing the innocent death tolls are multiplied and magnified by carefully planned propaganda campaigns as they force their friends and neighbors to become unwilling human shields. That is the diabolical strategy of the Palestinian propaganda machine. Bad religion and bad wars are real. Nevertheless, I know that my God is good. By the way, Muslims were certainly not the first religious fanatics to wreak havoc on Americans. Many World War II veterans were all too familiar with the horrifying tactics of Japan's suicidal kamikaze pilots. Perhaps we should have asked our fathers and grandfathers how they manage this form of evil. Those who survived the Second World War in the Pacific learned to defeat Japan's religious fanatics. But such lessons are not learned easily. During the era of Vietnam, our troops learned that sometimes it was impossible to tell the players from the spectators. You see, in addition to taking heavy casualties from North Vietnamese regular troops, American GIs were regularly under fire from Viet Cong guerrillas in villages. Similar to the terrorism of Iraqi, Iranian, Saudi, Taliban, or Palestinian jihadists, our troops in the Vietnam era also experienced parallel forms of evil. They too were engaged by civilian women and children wired with explosives by the Viet Cong. Such inhuman military practices are beyond the comprehension of rational beings. Bad religion, bad wars, and bad politics cause bad men to turn innocent civilians into weapons of destruction like pawns in deadly chess games. Sometimes the most dangerous enemy is the one you cannot recognize until it is too late. Vietnam created a political, military, and emotional quagmire. I wish Vietnam had ended differently. I wish we hadn't condemned American patriots as lackeys or honored revolutionaries of foreign governments as heroes. Some of us foolishly preferred the views of Karl Marx and we enjoyed quoting the sayings of Mao Tse Tung's Little Red Book. We called policemen pigs. We were confused about duty, service, and patriotism. But I need to be honest, and I have a confession to make about my own behavior during that era. But I'm out of time. In closing, I must ask you, do you believe we are better dead than red? In our next episode, I will challenge your thinking on the topic. Meanwhile, please drop me a line with your thoughts. Email me, randy at crosstalk.org, or write to me at Crosstalk, P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106, USA. You can call toll-free anywhere in America at 1-800-688-3422. 
and you can watch this entire series on our YouTube channel. Visit our website, crosstalk.org. I read all of my emails and each of the letters you mail me, and I do hope you will come back for our next episode of Crosstalk. Till then, my name is Randy Weiss, and I want to remind everyone that Jesus is Lord, and Eve was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Shalom.